The Milwaukee Bucks just became only the sixth number one seed to get upset in the first round in NBA history. And I can't help but think their head coach, Mike Budenholzer, is saying to himself, And it's his whole system of defense that had Bucks fans screaming as he couldn't seem to make one adjustment to stop the undeniable power of playoff Jimmy. As a coach, it became infuriating to see the same alignments and matchups presented to Butler over and over again, allowing him to post unheard of shooting and scoring numbers. And the only explanation was that Coach Bud was telling us, Here's how it unfolded. The Heat would set a ball screen for Jimmy with their center, knowing that the Buck centers would give them up to 15 feet of space in their drop coverage, which for a mid-range shooter like Jimmy is head-scratching. The Heat weren't content to just set high screen and rolls though. Here's a double ball screen that sees Portis dropping to the free throw line and then Lopez below the dotted line, just allowing Jimmy Buckets a free throw line jumper wide open. They continued this throughout the series, just backing up in this notion that luring mid-range shots is good, but it would then let him get all the way to the rim for layups. There's no other way to explain this lack of focus on such a singular point of attack other than to say they simply weren't prepared. Look at how Lopez drops down but then tries to jump back to his own man without realizing how they never recovered. I mean, this has got to be a joke, right? The confusion was evident on this end of quarter possession where you know Jimmy is going to run the clock down for an ISO. So why is Drew Holiday suddenly switching off of Butler to force Grayson Allen to guard him on an island? They must intend to send a double team out of this, right? Right? This land of confusion spans a country mile as we see numerous times when his defender would literally fall asleep while guarding him on the weak side. And the thing about Jimmy is, he's one of the best cutters in the league, and despite knowing how dangerous he is, you'd think at least his man would be focused 100% on him. This happened too many times. This was almost hilarious, as nobody in the Bucks even picks up the only guy you have to be really concerned with, and then Bobby Portis pushes his own man into Butler for a foul and free throws. There were all sorts of weird things happening, like a player as indispensable and as much of an X-Factor as Bobby Portis being benched over the course of the series like this. And the Heat were one of the worst three-point shooting teams in the league this year, yet they torched the Bucks' defense to the tune of 45%. Now, the Bucks have been able to keep their bigs hanging in the lane for years and still post a good defensive rating overall, even though the trend was getting worse until this year, but they never really defended the three-point shot well. And this was a perfect storm since the Heat utilized so many handoffs into triples, leaving the Bucks bigs in no position to even wave at the shooters because they're so far away. And this defensive method never ever changed the entire series. I caught one time where Lopez came running out in the fourth quarter at the shooter and the Heat are well prepared for this too, as they quickly find the snipers. It was the same for the pick and roll. They kept dropping and hoping the wide open guys would miss. No switching, not even a show, and it had to be frustrating for these guys to execute a game plan that was giving the other team target practice. The rare instance where Lopez stepped up to be involved and he's in the wrong position and they literally expected Drew to stop penetration at the dotted line and close back out to the corner shooter. The Giannis experience was extremely interesting in this series considering he was going up against one of the best coaches in the NBA and a very good defense. Of course, he injured his back in game one and missed two whole games, but the irony here is that the only game they actually won was the game he didn't play, as the offense moved better, lots more passing, a much higher offensive rating, and not losing too much on the defensive end either. Don't get me wrong, he was still dominant for big stretches of the series, and it didn't seem like his back was bothering him too much with plays like this. But his turnovers can be confounding for someone in the MVP conversation. Many times, it looks like he's trying to execute a move like he's practiced a thousand times before without defense. The problem is, there are defenders out there, and at times, it's too easy to draw simple charges from him as he barrels through the lane without a sense of avoidance. But he also gets caught in these situations unable to recognize the help defense trying to get deflections, and these kind of turnovers shouldn't be happening to a player of his experience. Even though Giannis has been through it all, playoff intensity can hit us right where it hurts. 
Add to that, So Rare has a postseason long playoff tournament. This will be a cumulative league that gets you a total tournament score with real life prizes totaling over $100,000 for So Rare managers that finish at or near the top of the leaderboard. Here's the lineup I set up based on salary cap management and previous playoff performance. And I'm counting on Steph Curry to go supernova. Here's how I did last week in my tournament, fifth place. Not too bad. Each week, you can set a new lineup, accumulate points, then watch these guys perform outrageous feats of skill that can win you real life prizes. Click on the link below, set your playoff lineups right now. Terms apply and game rules can be found at SoRare.com. His post-up efficiency is merely average, and he turns it over a ton, primarily because he's got pretty sloppy footwork down there. Here he doesn't quite travel despite Spolcher's protests, but his feet get too close together and then he lifts his left foot pivot up before the ball is out of his hands for an obvious travel. On this left block post-up, he slides both feet after controlling the ball, then establishes the right foot as his pivot foot, then slides that a few feet in order to get around Bam for the layup. This wasn't called, but it should have been, and a good reason why he really needs to clean this up. Game 5 to start the 4th, we see the beginning of the end for the Bucks, as Giannis establishes his right foot as the pivot by catching the ball in the air and landing on it. He promptly lifts it and puts it back down for a travel, but even if you want his left foot to be the pivot, he lifts that one before releasing the ball for another travel. On the spin move, we can say his right foot is the gather step and the left foot is the pivot. You see this one slide twice before he mercifully steps out of bounds. This sort of turnover simply cannot happen in the fourth quarter of an elimination game. In overtime, on the duck in, he lands with the left foot down first. That's supposed to be his pivot, but he moves it and then foolishly exposes the ball. Not only is he stripped, but it goes off his foot for another costly turnover. The post play got sloppy enough that Spolster decided to lure him into it by putting Vincent on him to start the possession. Jimmy is great at digging down and Bam is reading this the whole way and the turnovers are beginning to pile up. In game 4 there is no real way to explain this turnover other than he just wasn't up for it and shouldn't have been bringing the ball up. This gave the Heat their first lead of the entire game and propelled them to the victory at home. All these issues mean the Bucks shouldn't be relying on Giannis in the post of all places and yet they're trying to end the game a little early here. He ends the dribble at this point, and I'd say his left foot is the pivot, which makes this a travel, but even if we say his right foot was a pivot, it appears he lifts it slightly and puts it back down. He can't get balanced well enough for this awkward jump hook and the heat get a stop. Miami runs an elbow get with Bam and Jimmy, and this is where you'd actually want Lopez dropped farther off so he can get underneath Butler on the switch. But Jimmy is much faster and Bam is a great passer and now the lead is only three. A minute earlier, the Bucks misplayed this curl by Jimmy, since Giannis must be two steps off of love to help. Instead, he's glued to his man and Jimmy gets another easy shot. So this time, Drew goes underneath the screen, which triggers a flare cut to the three-point line. I get it, Jimmy isn't the three-point shooter, but in the playoffs, he damn sure is. And in this situation, you cannot give the other team anything, and yet, here we are. The Bucks try running elbow get, which works well because the Heat will not guard Giannis outside the paint. Love almost gets to the spot first, but Giannis gets downhill and finishes through the contact nicely. His free throw form has become one of the ugliest and most arrhythmic in the league. I count four different segments, and there's no way he can be consistent like this. Attacking the huge height mismatch in the post with Middleton is not a bad idea, but Jimmy distracts him while Vincent knocks the ball loose. And this was about to be one of the most amazing steals, saves, and transition buckets we'd ever seen, almost like this one by Michael Jordan against the Pistons in the conference finals. If only Strews could have dug this one up off the short hop. Give credit to Budenholzer for running that same play that got Giannis an and one. However, this time, Strews comes way off the corner shooter, and they get him to do the one thing he shouldn't be doing, taking a jumper. He kicks out his legs, waits to release on the way down, and it's not even close. But this is where it got crazy. Up by four with 14 to go, all they have to do is play solid defense, grab that rebound, and the game should be done. Wes doesn't play terrible defense, but not close enough, and Vincent nails it. Of course they have to press and then foul. The easier pass for Drew would be back to Giannis, but everyone knows you cannot throw it to him because they'll foul him, so why is he even inbounding the ball? Perhaps take the timeout and just inbound it to half court, where you can have more room to operate and get the right personnel in the game. 
Instead, without that much pressure, Holiday overthrows Middleton, who's getting a little contact near the waist when this all starts, but it's not nearly enough to merit a foul. However, this became a problem when the slot official called the foul on Lowry here. What? There was absolutely no foul, and Spolster has always been very wise to save his challenges for moments like these. But here's the issue. Because the ball got loose and Lowry didn't recover it in real time, they have to make this into a jump ball despite the fact that the fair thing would have been to give possession back to the Heat. I almost fell out of my chair when I saw what happened next, folks. The ball goes right to Giannis and he is so afraid of getting fouled, he panics and just throws the ball away. Through an incredible act of hustle, Middleton was able to save it and all should have been forgiven. And don't forget, he did the same exact thing earlier in the year and it almost cost him that game. But Jimmy had been playing mind games with Drew all series long and he chokes the first one, leaving the door open for what Spolstra can come up with in this huddle. He opts for a variation of the winner play, which requires a lot to the far side of the court. By bringing the other two players up, he makes us into a 2 on 2 action with zero help. Everybody is holding on to everybody. The ball is floating up in the air. There's Connaughton holding Butler, but there is Butler getting him off with a nice little shove. And Jimmy ends up horizontal in the air and heaving it up to drop in without using the backboard. The degree of difficulty is off the charts and now we're in overtime. Wow. The last two minute report said there should have been a call on Connaughton, but I'm pretty sure they're just going in order of how these two things happened. And once the first hold was missed, the second push becomes irrelevant. In the overtime, Giannis gets away with the hop travel by gathering the ball, lifting off that left foot and landing on it consecutively, but there was also contact during this, so let's call it even. He can only split the free throws and here's a big issue. By having his 10 toes pointing to the rim, he can't comfortably get his elbow under the ball and this kind of looks like Michael Kidd Gilchrist shooting the basketball. The execution of the Bucks' offense wasn't good all night, and they run that elbow get again, but this time, unclear why they're running it to his left and why Drew Holiday cut right into that space. Left with no moves to make, he tries the one-handed push. As this game and their season was slipping away, I can't figure out why they go for yet another left block post-up. While they do foul Bam out, they're just putting him in a place where his form is going to plague him, and he promptly misses both free throws with terrible sinking of his legs and arms. This baseline out of bounds play was hardly the most clever thing you'll see, but Lopez decides to switch to Jimmy without communicating. Why the hell is Giannis standing that close to his man here? He should have been able to help, but instead the nails are going in the coffin. Incredibly, they still had a sliver of hope after forcing Butler into a steal and catching the smallest guy guarding the tallest guy. And this time he uses good footwork to spin off of Vincent and hit the shot to cut it to two. Giannis then gets too close to the Max Struess three-point shot landing. And on the replay, it's really close to not being a foul. But Budenholzer had already used his challenge in the first quarter on this pretty clear charge. So the game is essentially over until Struess misses the third free throw. It came down to this. Down two with a chance to tie or win it. I know coaches like to let the players go before the defense is set up. But at this moment here, the defense is in position. There's no advantage. And you have two timeouts. Budenholzer waves his arm to say, just do it. And what is Giannis doing? He just dribbles into Butler and falls down, taking him completely out of the rest of the play while no one else wants to even look at the basket until the clock runs out without a shot being taken. Can you hear me shaking my head? This whole sequence speaks to a bigger issue that ran throughout the entire series and will no doubt prompt the owners to take a serious look at the whole roster. Budenholzer simply did not prepare this team to win and quite frankly, he struggled through a lot of playoff series without showing the kind of ingenuity and cleverness that would give his team any type of advantage. While Giannis has proven he can win a title and make pressure free throws, his development has stalled and well-coached teams can prepare and neutralize his impact on the game overall. There is simply no way a number one seed should lose to a team that has to go so deep into its roster like the Heat had to do. And there were total collapses late in both Game 4 and Game 5 when the offense would not function for a variety of reasons, including Giannis needing better moves against great defenders. Let's not forget, the Bucks were down 2-0 in the 2021 playoffs and were an inch away from being eliminated. And the talk then was that a head coaching change was imminent. While Budenholzer survived that, many of the same issues then are still present now. And until the coaching can get better and Giannis trains differently so that he can have more of a profound impact against the elite defenses, I suspect it's now time for the Bucks to... Stay.